Welcome to the Parish Art Museum podcast, where we aspire to provide opportunities for learning, sharing, and celebrating the many innovative and pioneering artists who call the East End home. Come back each week to find new and impactful experiences in the arts. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Julie Solovyova. I'm the Director of Cultural Programming here. And we're really honored to host this conversation tonight between the artist Tomashi Jackson and a very wonderful representative of the Parish Art Museum, Corinne Arni, who's the senior curator there of arts reach projects that focus on art and social impact and social change, as well as special projects. Our programming here at Noya House focuses on creating a space for positive friction, and we really try to bring to the fore ideas and forces and people whose projects tackle issues of social impact and change and creativi creativity pushing culture forward. So I think that really applies to Tamashi's practice really well. Um, if you haven't seen her work, it is currently a part of the Whitney Biennial. That's actually wrapping up really soon, I think around the 22nd of September. So hopefully this will inspire you to go and check it out. And then Corinne will also tell us about the special project that they're working on together at the Parish Art Museum, which is in Watermill on the east end of Long Island. And if you haven't been to that wonderful institution, please do make a trip. It's very much worth it. And they organize exhibitions and projects all year round. And we're really big fans. So without further ado, Corinne and Tamashi, I welcome you to the stage. Thank you. Hello, good evening, welcome. Thank you, Noya House, for having us, and thank you, Tomashi, for talking to me tonight. I would like to start with an anecdote that happened just a few days ago at the Whitney Museum, and I think that's going to tell you a little bit about how or who Tomashi is as an artist, as a person, as someone I am so much looking forward to working with. So uh, Tomashi was having a talk at the Whitney uh, Sunday afternoon, 4 p.m. I'm like, all right, this is great. It's going to be an hour. Uh, she's going to talk, and um, we're going home. But um, no, um, Tomashi had gathered 10 people who had never met before. They were all experts in their own rights who had done research about a topic that was incredibly important to Tomashi and that actually had informed her work at the Whitney. And it was about um, the displacement of people of color at Seneca Village, which then became Central Park, and also the third party program in Brooklyn, which disowned mostly people of color, homeowners only, who suddenly had their property taken away. And so Tomashi had gathered archeologists, historians, lawyers, artists, a whole bunch of people, 10 people who came together and who brought testimony about these facts and these histories and really brought these people to life. And uh, to me, this was just another artwork of Tomashi's. It was a performance. It was orchestrated, uh, choreographed by Tomashi. It lasted almost three hours. Tonight's talk's not going to be three hours, but anyway. I was just so taken by it, and I think it really told me a lot about you, who you are, how you work, um, that you do very deep research about the topics you're interested in, that you're going to create work based on these topics, and, and also the people that you manage to bring together that would otherwise not come together and create something new and something beautiful. And so I just want to start with that, and I want to ask you, how did you get interested in Seneca Village and the third party program? How did you make that connection? And how did the work for the Whitney actually uh, got created? And so, by the way, those are the first uh, few slides that you will see they're going to be rotating as we talk. Well, can I thank you first, Corinne, for having Absolutely. me? Absolutely. Yes. And thank you, Noya House, for having us. What a beautiful place. How did the work that's in the Whitney start? I don't know now. I found, somehow I, I found the journalism of Kelly Mena, Stephen Witt, and Subasa Berg, who were all at the time working for a small news website a Brooklyn-based news website called Kings County Politics. And it was one of their early pieces of what is now a suite of something like, there might be 20 articles or something now, but yes. at the time there was only two. And I came across one of them, uh, and they were talking about 
what they hashtagged Brooklyn real estate scandal about a number of Brooklynites, uh, black elders, who uh, have owned their property for decades, fully paid for properties, who had come to them uh, for help because they'd woken up to find notices on their doors telling them that they no longer own their property. So basically, just because somebody didn't pay their water bill, um, they were suddenly, tran their, their property was transferred to a nonprofit organization. And sometimes, basically, and sometimes, sometimes not. Right. So like sometimes, well, but, but first of all, they, were, they received a notice saying that they no longer own their property with no, with no other notice, right? So, and, and then when they inquired through the various offices that, the housing offices that they normally uh, pay, have paid their property taxes and water bills to, they weren't getting any, they weren't getting any, any help, right? So these are people who've owned their properties for a long time, who've paid their taxes for a long time, paid their water bills. Sometimes people have, uh, would come to find that their accounts showed that they were behind, in one case, I think like $3,000, a $3,000 unpaid water bill. Sometimes, I think that same family, they were actually paying, multiple families experienced paying cash or check directly to those offices, and their accounts were not credited even after they paid that money. Right. So their, uh, their homes were pushed into clusters of uh, foreclosures, a practice that had never happened, that's never happened before, unbeknownst to them, with no warning, uh, whole blocks, this is blockbusting, whole blocks of people, their homes are forced into for foreclosure, and uh, these clusters of, of foreclosures are put, were put before one judge who would approve them all outright. Right. And so then people would then wake up to the notice on their door that if they wanted to remain in their home, that they would have to pay rent to a not-for-profit organization that had taken over the ownership of their home. So really crazy um, occurrence. And, yeah. And it so was shocking to yeah, me. Well, yeah. And and I, so I, I, it, it shocked me so much that I still don't remember. I don't remember what I was looking at. I'm trying to wean myself from Facebook, so I'm not even sure if I saw it there. I don't, I don't, know, how I, I don't know how I came across this article or who shared it. And then you but got in touch with the journalists. Eventually, and, but right. eventually. Uh, but so I started reading about it, and, and when, I read, when I read that first article, I immediately thought of uh, what little I know about Seneca Village, what, I, what I'd heard about the, the village, the black-owned properties that existed on the west side of what is now Central Park. So and what was really amazing on Sunday is how you showed that these were actually middle-class families. They owned their properties, but it was always depicted as a wasteland and which sort of uh, justified to take it away and make it into what is now Central Park. Mm -hmm. So this became the sort of the juxtaposition of two occurrences of displacement of people of color who owned their properties, which informed the work that you did at the, at the, for the Whitney, mostly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And can you just talk about the, um, how you went about the process? How, how did you think about how you wanted to present that? What kind of material, I know, Printing became important. You wanted to show actual images of the people, but you work very much with abstraction. So just talk a little bit about the process of how you turned that into, into an artwork. That is very compelling, by the way. Oh, thank you. Well, the, the articles just kept growing. So first there was two articles, and then every time I went back to the page devoted to the, com the collaborative work of Kelly and Stephen, and Subasa, they were just piling up. So neighborhood committee meetings and more people were coming forward. And what we learned at the talk at the Whitney was that a source became a, a source made themselves known to Stephen. This all started for them because someone called them and said that their property had been seized and no one was no one was doing anything about it. And and he followed that lead. And then, you know, the onion just continued to peel back. And so there was all this material, all this contemporary material, and I'm interested, I'm continually interested in like visualizing these moments when the ultra present collapses with what seems to be a distant past. Right, and it's actually not That's so, not so different, yeah. Yeah, so, and I use uh, archival photographs. Sometimes I take, make the pictures myself, I use other photographers' pictures. 
and pictures from archives to break them down into halftone lines. This is what makes the printmaking so crucial. I break them down into halftone lines and then I attempt to weave them together or to collapse them together so that when the colors interact, they then make a new color. So I have the present, but I had to find the past. So I started hunting, and I thought that I thought I'd be able to. Well, first I went to the Cooper Union Library. I'm a graduate of the Cooper Union, and I went back to what I consider my my, my home library in New York City, and told the librarians there what I was looking for. And then I went to go teach a class. So I was at Cooper because I was back to teach my first drawing class there. So you were right at the source. <laughs> yeah. I was back at the scene of the crime. Because I came here to New York in 2005 as a, a student at Cooper Union. And so I was back there to teach. And in, be, in between my classes, I stopped by the library and asked for help. And this is actually like really, really beautiful. I had to run. And uh, I came back after my class was over. I think I had like maybe an hour before the library was going to close. The librarians, Dale and Claire, who had been helping me, they were already gone for the day. I went back to the area that we were looking in, the, the section of the library that we were looking in before I had to go to class. They had left bright green strips of paper. They were all like, it took me a minute to figure out what was going on. But I was looking, I was going back to try to get the books that it seemed like we were gonna pull. And then I realized that there was just this beautiful tapestry of bookmarks in the stacks for me, uh, clues for me to go back and pull the books that they continued to look for while I was gone. So that is what, they gave a, a stack of books. I think there was a, there was a catalog from the Metropolitan uh, Museum of Art, specifically on Central Park, that was published, I think, 1990. Maybe that was like 2012. But the most poignant and significant book that came from Claire and Dale's continuing to dig while I went to go teach a class was The Park and the People by uh, Rosenzweig and Blackmore. So I, I followed that. I, I didn't know that it was such a seminal text. It was published by uh, Cornell University Press in 1996. And there's one chapter devoted to the people of the park before the park became the park. But the book is like this. So it, it covers like the entire life of the park. But what I came to find out later was that it was the first time researchers had ever devoted any real attention or time into the lives of the people who lived in Seneca Village before it was destroyed, before it was raised. And so that gave me all these clues. From there, I thought that, but there were no... There were some drawings, but there were not, there, were, there was not, there was, photography was happening for sure, but there was, there were no, there weren't that many usable images. So, you know, but, I just But thought, you used some of those images and they are in, well, that's going to come up. Hey, They're in your... The parish. <laughs> did I use any from the book? I did, I did use some from the book. The images that are in the book are mostly of the creators of the park of uh, Olmsted Law. But also owners, homeowners um, from Seneca Village. No. 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 Okay. That's what I'm saying. Like I was I was like, okay, that's well, what's here, it's here. There were condemnation records. That's okay. that's actually like really what was the the biggest thing that they found, Blackmore and Rosenzweig. Uh, in their research they unearthed condemnation records that the city had created once the city decided that it wanted the property. But so I thought I would just be able to find images somewhere else, like at the Schomburg. So I went to the, uh, to the Schomburg Center for African American Research uptown right. and spent some time there and was surprised to continue to come up with nothing, nothing that was really usable. And the librarian there sent me out further into uh, the greater New York library system and into the archives, the digital archives, where I eventually found images of Mary Joseph Lyons and Albro Lyons, who were black abolitionists of the 1800s who owned property, who inherited property in Seneca Village. But it was, there were no images of the village. There were portraits, like daguerreotype portraits of them. So this, it became um, every step that I took, I found it was more complicated than I had anticipated to find images that were usable to collapse with the present. But you stuck to it and, and you just went for it. And how much, yeah. how much, yeah. These are, that's the best one. That's the most absolute, but that's the best one. So you took a homeowner that's for Brooklyn. Albert Lyons, yeah. yeah. And uh, McConnell Dorsey, who still hasn't, who still hasn't gotten his property back from the city of New York. Wow. So that piece is, it, it'll come back around again, but that piece is the most, I think it states what's happening with the whole body of work the most clearly. I feel like it's the, um, what do they call it? Yes, it's the legend. It's the legend okay. for the entire body of work. So Yosef Albers, 
taught um, when he was on the, he and Ani Albers uh, fled Nazi Germany and came to the United States and taught at Black Mountain College and, and eventually at uh, Yale University. And while he was at Yale, he facilitated these amazing classrooms where students produced all of these color studies. And he believed that practice comes before theory. So what we came to understand later is interaction of color, like a seminal work for, for anyone who studies visual art. So that was a book that he published in the 60s. Yeah, in, in the 60s. In, yeah, mm -hmm. Interaction of Color. Interaction of Color was published in the 60s at, uh, from Yale University Press. And it's, it's what so many of my professors have done, which is collect the best student work that comes out of their semesters. And in that, but in that, in that book, in learning that book, um, I learned about the color studies themselves. You know, color is a is a, is not a static phenomenon. It, it it it's it's sometimes people try to like declare that color is absolute, but color is always changing depending on what is nearest its edge. So that legend works because it's the closest, most absolute color study I think I've made in response to what Albers found about color interaction. So it's a, it's a color study that seeks to make two colors look like one. Two slightly different reds are printed side by side and they, and they collapse just ever so slightly. The images, one by Subasa Berg, one from the New York Public Library Archive, are broken down into half tone lines that are going in two opposite diagonal directions. So when they cross, when, when a viewer is close enough to, to really look closely at it, it creates a crosshatch, which is a principle of drawing, a simple graphic principle of drawing. So these two slightly different reds, depending on where one is standing, can look like one, or it could look like two, depending on how sensitive one's eyes are. And both of those men are black men who are New Yorkers who had their properties taken by the city. And so that's the way you use color and the way you're thinking about Joseph Albers' color theory is, is also something that you use to comment on how we socially view color yeah. and, and how we define color and mm -hmm. color as a certain color exists because another color next to it exists. Mm -hmm. and, and, that it, and that so much of it is an optical illusion. I mean, when I studied where Albers taught, at the end I realized through like making these paintings that uh, my big aha moment was when I painted on the back of a, a translucent material that I'd, I'd layered and, and prepared this gauze that I work with sometimes. Why, I painted why, on why the, the gauze? Um, why do you use gauze? It's like flesh. Um, it's also used in, for medical um, mm -hmm. uses. Yeah. 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 So I dyed this gauze and, and I painted uh, simple squares. I was trying to break everything down to its simplest components to see what was left, you know, stripping myself of like everything aesthetically to see what, to see what was really left, right? If, if, I'm, if, my, if my gestures are not gratuitous and everything is intentional, then what is, what is left? And then like what spirit arises from that? I, I, don't, I don't know. So with that, with that piece though, with the apartheid blues, with the, uh, this diptych apartheid blues, I painted, I was making like a, a, just a big color study that came away from the wall and because the material, the, the, the surface became opaque where the paint was layered in that square, but everything else was colored and translucent. So light was pushing through the gauze and onto the back, and I had um, onto the, which is the wall. And I pulled the material away from the wall and sewed it so that it could bear weight. And I had a, a plank from a wooden floor holding it at the bottom. And then I you know, put these other pieces of wood against the wall so that it remained protruded so that the, to see the painting was to see it as a sculpture also. And then I painted on the back of one of these things. So like there's like two red squares. Let's say it's like, I think one, the top maybe was like dyed purple. The other, the bottom was dyed blue. And then the two squares painted on either sections were red. And then it occurred to me to paint a, a, a opaque yellow square on the back of one of those red squares. And then the, the whole piece sat in front of a reflective piece of um, insulation board. So there's this moment late at night in my studio when I finally saw it, when I finally arranged everything and everything was dry, because that takes forever. When I was looking at this thing and I'm seeing these red and magenta squares, but, when I, but what's bouncing off right behind it is yellow, like a bright yellow in the same shape of that square. So then I was like, oh, that's it, that's it. Color is a projection. 
Color is a reflection. Color is an optical illusion. And at the time I was focusing on uh, the work of Thurgood Marshall and with LDF, with the uh, Legal and Educational Defense Fund and their efforts, their Im incredibly brilliant efforts to break uh, Jim Crow, um, de jure Jim Crow. And so Crow. That, that became another series of works that was what, that's what was happening. Board. Well, that's that's what was happening at the time. But so I was like looking. I was taking a color class with Anoka Faruqi, going through like every single, every single sentence of uh, interaction of color. And on my own, I was reading the legislative archives of uh, that became Brown versus the Board of Education. All the the preliminary cases that led to the Supreme Court case. So again, major research on your part. I mean, I was to, reading. I was reading. Well, yeah, that's research. I was reading, um, but that's but that was like this big aha when I saw a collapse in what Marshall and his team were doing, and what Albers had had, what they all had arrived, what they all arrived at, which is that color is a projection. And you arrived to that conclusion by actually going into your studio and working with the material, working with the colors, and creating the work. So, does a lot of your work come about that way? That you you experiment a lot, you you work with colors and Bye. materials. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, but I also go places. So, I mean, it depends. Like, this, the places where I am, I guess, kind of like, what is it? I feel like I'm kind of like a canary or something. Like, I, I absorb what's happening around me, and then I'm trying, in my effort to try to understand it, to try to understand, like, the social parameters that are happening. Ideas come, and then I try to visualize it. How long did it take you that to? Makes yeah, it makes sense. How long did it take you to create the work for the Whitney Biennial, for example? I secretly knew quite some time ago. So, so I had been thinking about it, but I was in the middle of moving to a new studio. I was teaching at Massachusetts College of Art and Design in Boston at the time when I found out. Yeah, so I was thinking about it. But things didn't really, I didn't, things, things really, so I actually, so my work was continuing to read the journalism of Kelly, Stephen, and Subasa. And then when I got to Cooper in the fall, if this is 2019, when I got to Cooper in the fall of 2018, that's when I started going into the stacks and collecting, what, what I thought was going to be collecting imagery, what, what really ended up being collecting information, more and more information. And then the printing... I was desperate for a print shop. Desperate, desperate for a print shop. And a good friend, Kenny Rivero, introduced me to people at the, Black, the Robert Blackburn print shop. And they print with some of my favorite artists, my favorite contemporary artists. Such as who? Such as uh, Alexandra Bell, uh, whose counter narrative series, uh, she prints with a master printmaker there. I got to work with the same master printmaker that works with Alexandra Bell. John Andrews, an amazing, just an amazing artist, an amazing man. So, yeah, so once that got clear, I don't know, I was, I, f I feel like that's the schoolhouse rock. That's from uh, the subliminals now. I'm not supposed to talk to the screen, sorry. But I like looking at pictures. Delving into the archives, that part be was like really difficult. I didn't, I didn't expect it to be so hard. Because I'd like liter literally like running all over the city trying to find pictures. And eventually things came together. I feel like just things came together. Once I found a print shop home to belong to and to work with, then um, things started to make more sense in the studio. Um, we also did uh, the printing, the archival printing on the big sheets of vinyl, like a refrigerator, refrigerator type vinyl at Dugal Print Solutions. Yeah. That was amazing. So the, this project kind of, um, it, it, made me, it made me remain agile and limber. Um, and it made me ask for help a lot. And the help that I got was pretty amazing. It all, it all feels pretty amazing. I'm sure people will want to help you. I mean, you're just that kind of person. <laughs> um, so well, because painting, I mean, I'm, I'm used to doing things myself. You know, right. like I consider these things to be paintings, but they're also, they, they're produced from research-driven efforts. I'm not the specialist in like any of this, which is what made the Whitney talk so like overwhelming because I finally had all of these specialists that I had been following in the same place at the same time. And it just kind of like, I, I couldn't even hold it. And they were willing to spend a Sunday afternoon yeah, with you and, for and three, three hours. Yeah, and three hours wasn't yes, enough. And no. it wasn't enough. So do you consider yourself a painter? Because you talk about paintings. A lot of, or most of your works are collages using several materials. 
we'll talk about other materials like knitting or other medium like knitting and video in a minute, but you consider yourself mostly or primarily a painter? Yeah, I identify as a painter for sure. Yeah, even though some of the um, collages look quite sculptural. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. And knitting, so what, how did that come about? Because you use knit the knitting in some of your photographs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. partially to cover people's faces. Yeah. So can you talk about that a little yeah. bit? And you, we will see some of those images coming up. After Cooper Union, I went to MIT. I thought I was going to transition into, I thought I was going to sneak into, into being an architect. I shouldn't say sneak. I was, um, I, was interested in, I was interested in some things. I was interested in things that were very sculptural. And I was interest, I'm interested, I remain interested in ecology and the overuse of one-time, uh, the overabundance of one-time use plastics. It's something that keeps me up at night. And, and I'd done a project while at Cooper. It was the first time that I, that I recognized that I was actively seeking to produce a new language from a research-driven effort. I'd gone to Belize to do a project about collective memory and waste management. Oh, right on. And yeah, so one thing led to another, and I ended up at MIT to be around engineers and technologists and architects in this effort to turn this art into something usable as a structural component. And yeah, oh shoot, I lost myself. We were talking about knitting, but knitting. You, yeah, you, so I was really stressed you went out to after that. Yeah, so that's yeah. Okay. Well, that's 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 what happened. So okay. um, the one person that I wanted to study with in building technology was going to be teaching in Singapore for the next like year or two, and it's the it's the best building technology program in the world I've heard, and there's like three faculty. So that kind of really I didn't know what to do with myself, and I was really stressed out and very uncertain. And I, and I fell in with some very peaceful women in uh, my little area of Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, and they taught me how to knit. And at the time, the thesis that I wrote for that program had to do with black women's bodies as transformative agents in public space while engaged in informal labor with no social protection. And something that I saw here in New York City for the first time. Not that it doesn't happen everywhere, I just never seen it in a walking city, how whole parts of town will be awash with women who look like me at, at certain hours, and then at other hours, if I'm there, I'm the only one. So I found that um, fascinating, became a thesis, and then my life imitated that work. And I became a nanny in the Cambridge area and while learning how to knit. So the first, the f first it was a practical concern I'd wait out in the snow for children to get out of the, to get off their school buses or to take them to gymnastics, and I couldn't keep my neck warm. Um, I'd wrap my head and I'd wrap my neck, and then I'd wrap everything together, but I couldn't keep my neck warm. So when I, the first thing that I wanted to knit were some leg warmers and this, and like a, a, a sleeve, just to keep my neck and my head warm. And as soon as I started really having fun with it, once my fingers memorized the moves through song, but once I didn't need a song anymore and my, my hands can just like do it without me looking at them, I immediately became interested in what was happening with color. And I immediately wondered if they were paintings actually. Mm -hmm. If they, like when I hung them up at home on the wall, I just started making, I would, I would, it would be up all night, I couldn't go to sleep without like finishing uh, however many rows and I'd hang them up on the wall and they'd be bulbous and jut out and they were really beautiful and I wondered if maybe they were paintings or sculptures and people kept wanting to buy them from me but I refused because I wanted to know if they were paintings. And then you started using them in photographs. Well, then I took them to yeah. Yale with me. So right. then I secretly applied to Yale a couple of years later. Right. Okay. With Have these paint, with with actual paintings, with portraits of other of myself and other domestic workers. Right. And then I took them with me there, and I found that they were a key to an ecosystem that surprised me because uh, photo and video actually is the key to bring them all together. The paintings, uh, the paintings as paintings, the painting, the paintings as sculpture the archival material and contemporary material. And at the time, there were all of these ridiculous murders of black children happening at the hands of adults in uniform. Uh, so this is 2014, 2016. And all of these like acquittals, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, who was killed by a vigilante. This just absurd, like absurd, absurd devaluation of the lives of black children, which coincided perfectly with this research that I was doing into Brown versus the Board of Education, because the LDF centered little black children, although most of the people that they represented 
at that time were collegiate, were collegiate students. So I was seeing all of this. I was seeing like the ultra president of the devaluation of black children's lives and reading about the fight against the devaluation of black children's lives. And what's, what, we had, what I had been told was a far away past, but really it's not long ago at all. And these knitted, these knitted color studies, when I would wrap them around people and sit those people in front of my paintings in an effort to make them a part of the painting, the people then became immersed in all of it because we are all awash in all of this. Not all of us are implicated. So like that was like the big aha, like that. Exactly. That was the big aha. Okay. And that the only way that I could hold that moment is uh, through video and see print photography. Okay, wonderful. We have little time left. I just want to segue into the parish, Watermill, your project next year. Yeah, so I'm we started about it. talking about this uh, a few months ago. And um, as you may know, the parish art museum is in Watermill in the Hamptons, the east end of Long Island. It's a beautifully designed museum by the Swiss architects Herzog and Dumeron. We find ourselves in a, in a place that has a, is beautiful and also has an incredible legacy of artist communities. But I moved there three years ago and I found out there's also all kinds of different communities that we never talk about, that we don't know about when we talk about the Hamptons. There's the Shinnecock Nation, an Indian reservation. There's a huge Latino population. There's a black population. And we never hear about it. And, and what I also found is that the, the area is incredibly segregated. And some of it, I think, is, is certainly structural. It's infrastructural. One thing that we started talking about, and one thing that I think has been an issue of concern for you is, is, is the whole notion of transportation. And so, for example, one thing that we learned is that ICE has really come into the Hamptons, has really started chasing Latino. They're, targ they're being targeted you know, in their cars, on the roads. And so a lot of Latinos, whether they're documented or not, are really afraid to go onto the roads to drive to their work. So basically, it's become impossible for them to go to work. We work with an organization called OLA, um, Organization for Latin Americans of the East End of Long Island, who are organizing cars and, and all kinds of media and transportation to get people to their work, to get them to doctors and so forth. So when I started to talk to Tomashi about it, she became really interested in, in that topic, and maybe we can just have a little conversation about that because obviously the exhibition is almost a year away so uh, still uh, a lot of it is in, in progress and Tomashi will also be in residency at the Watermill Center um, which is Bob Wilson's center in May which will also allow her to do more research and hold town hall, meet, town hall meetings with um, different members of the communities out in, in, in the Hamptons. So I'm just curious what, what sort of got you interested in, in in the project, in the Hamptons? And how does it connect to your work that you've been doing um, so far? A conversation with you, uh, talking with you and with Connie Tilton. I visited oh, out there. Here. Where's Connie? I can't see you. Oh, there. Hi. I've had the uh, opportunity to, to, to visit that community for a couple of summers. I didn't go this summer, but the previous two summers, I'd had like just very short and lovely visits out there. And with the, it's like the continually ramping up of this like state-sponsored, clearly targeted violence, terror. More and more communities have more and more stories of people being raided and snatched up, like where my studio is. I've been away most of the summer. I went to art camp this summer. And while I was away, there were brief moments when I checked in on the news. And at one point, I heard that people in my neighborhood where my studio is, uh, which is a, it's a, a, a deeply, richly, historically like multi-ethnic immigrant neighborhood, that on one of the hottest days of the summer, the parks were completely empty because people had heard that there were going to be ice raids. So they stayed, they kept their children inside, and they all stayed inside. So, yeah, I think talking with you and with Connie, I was starting to hear about this being more and more of an occurrence in the Hamptons. And, of course, that's a place, like so many, so many places in this country, that are impossible to traverse without regular transportation, without, you know, like, without, uh, if, uh, without private transportation. Exactly. And so, of course, that makes me think of the Green Book and... <laughs> 
you know, like how all of all of these things, all of the, these strategies for surviving continue to be relevant. So there's like this freedom that comes from being able to drive, but then there's this exposure and vulnerability to racist policing forces or vigilantes and night riders that um, that one is exposed to as well. So it, I got this. I got this from you and Connie that people were starting to be grabbed on the side of the road, you know, pulled over and snatched yeah, from their cars. Every day. Yes. Yeah. So I can't not see, I can't not, I can't unhear that. And yeah, that's like when I went to Georgia, I had never been to Atlanta somehow in my whole life. And I was invited to come out there, to go out there and do a project. And I just drove around with the curator and just kind of like breathed in the city and yeah, and, and observed. And what I eventually arrived at was uh, that transportation was an issue. I grew up in Los Angeles. I didn't know that there were other places that were so mm, defined by their gridlock, by like a highway and street gridlock, the way that LA is. And so that let, that opened up the door to research right. about like how transportation, how uh, limited public transportation has been used as a continual historic strategy to maintain segregated whites only suburbs and underfunded and largely immobile communities of color inside of the city centers. Right, and that's certainly the case. Yeah, the it sounds like so, it, yeah. yeah. So I have to go find out more. You will. But uh, yeah. Which also means that I have to... What's key here is that you know people are afraid. People are afraid, and rightfully so. When I was doing that research about um, domestic workers, when I was making those portraits of domestic workers in Cambridge, those women were like, why do you want my image? You know, like they were like, why do you want, why do you want to paint me? The people, people are afraid. So a key part about like why it's so wonderful that I've been invited out to Watermill to stay for a little while is that hopefully I'll get to know people and I'll get to figure out what I'm supposed to do that does not further endanger or exploit people who are already vulnerable yeah. and in fear. That's extremely important. And we're working with several organizations who work in these communities and you will be introduced and very much looking forward to, to your project. Thank you. I am too. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. But I'm sure there are questions. Darn. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I love your work and enjoyed the discussion tonight. There's another story in the Hamptons that you may want to look into. It's a story of segregation and dispossession and displacement. And it's the three historically black communities in Sag Harbor. They are historically black because when middle class black, or black Americans were able to buy homes, vacation homes, they couldn't buy them in traditionally white areas. So they all bought homes in the same areas. And these three neighborhoods are now changing because after about three generations of living uh, in, in these three communities in Sag Harbor, um, the children or grandchildren of the people who purchased the homes in the 1940s cannot afford uh, to maintain the homes. And the homes, different LLCs are moving in, buying homes, tearing down the original homes, and building mega mansions. And now these historically black communities are becoming white communities. So it's a, it's a story, as I, as, to use your words, of displacement. And, uh, but displacement. And this is dispossession, not just like, just full dispossession. Just dispossession of middle class African Americans. And so I think it just shows the vulnerability that just crosses socioeconomic lines. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What's your name? I'm Cheryl Wade, and I want to talk to you about something else. Okay. About, I've written a book about predatory lending and oh African Americans. Oh my God. And I want to use your art on the cover. Okay. okay. What's, wait, what's your book called? It's called Predatory Lending. Uh -huh. and the destruction of the African-American community. And it's coming out um, by Cambridge uh, in March 2020. I like Cambridge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like it I like them because they published me. Uh -huh. Wow, thank you. Thank you. Wow. Hi. Hi. Uh, I just want to say thank you to Corinne. Thank because you. Because you hunted me down. I'm Savannah from State of the Arts NYC. And yes, cause yes, yes, I remember yes, you came you to know. Bartholomew's talk yes. at La Long. Yes. But thank you for coming. Thank you. Because it's weird because almost everything your artist has shared tonight, I talk about every single week. 
I talk about Seneca Village. Wow. So just to give you some background on Seneca Village, it was, cre was created because of voting rights. Right. When America became a nation, we had a two-party system, the Federalist and the Democratic Republics. They basically, most commoners followed the leadership of those two partners. When commoners wanted to have more voting rights, they had a land requirement for voting. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. free blacks in New York said, why don't we take the land that nobody wants? Mm -hmm. That's how Seneca Village became. Mm -hmm. And you had Irish and Germans mm -hmm. who also asked to lease the land that they owned so that they too could have homes so that they could vote. And so when the city started to develop Central Park, all of the people were displaced mm -hmm. violently so mm -hmm. that they could create Central Park. So that's the first thing. I mm -hmm. couldn't believe that. Mm -hmm. You're talking about what I'm talking about. Two, when you talk about displacement, you have to also go back to what happened at the end of the Civil War. At the end of the Civil War, that's when Reconstruction started. Lincoln wanted to give 40 acres in the mule. He dies. Johnson is in place. He gives back the land to the plantation owners. And so what happened was that's when sharecropping began. So therefore, blacks were then not allowed to have ownership of land. So that's mm -hmm. two. Three, when the end of World War II occurred, that's when the GI Bill came about to give white veterans the opportunity to own homes in the suburbs so that they could pass on to their family an inheritance. That's land, that's homes. Projects were built during Roosevelt's time. It was meant for white people, but then when they couldn't fill it, they put blacks in it, but then they helped those who were white to get a home, and that's how projects became in inner cities with blacks, Latino, and other people of color, and then they did not take care of those properties. That's why we have a NYCHA problem there's to this an day. There's an amazing book. Uh, my best friend is, uh, I'm also like really influenced and informed by my best friend, uh, Nia K. Evans. She's the executive director of a project you should know about called the Boston Ujima Project. It's the nation's oh. first ever democratic investment fund with the sole purpose of funding black, brown, and indigenous businesses in Boston, com communities that are historically and acceptedly constantly cut off from rich, uh, robust streams of formal capital. So she does that, but when, when I was a student at Cooper, she was studying education policy at Teachers College, and she's an she's a re she's a education researcher. She's a policy wonk. And she has, we have an amazing library together. <laughs> and she has a book called American Project. Mm. I can't remember who wrote it, but I remember, I remember reading yes. about it and thinking of Carrie James Marshall's work. Yes, yes. Um, and how, and how, and how uh, he visualized my people of Nickerson Gardens and the projects of, of Southern California. And then, of course, there's also David Simon's Show Me a Hero, which uh, really like well illustrates what happened in Yonkers around the attempt to create scatter site housing that like uh, dispersed or that like sought to like deconstruct humanely deconstruct what had happened with the projects. But in an American project, I read about how you know what Carrie James paints. That's the way it was supposed to be with like brooks and parks and lakes and ponds and all this stuff. And in American Project, you get to read about how like one by one policies were enacted, conversations happened that just left like literally slabs of concrete with like maybe a jungle gym if people were lucky. Like once it was clear who was going to be living there. So I just want to yeah. say this is amazing what you guys Thank have you. just done. Phenomenal. I Thank hope you, you come to the show next What's your time. I name? will. Right. Here's Savannah. My name is Savannah Bailey McLean. And you also need to know an artist by the name of Diane Smith, who's from Belize. I have a show going on right now where we honor the Garafuna people. You're killing me. No, I'm telling you. <laughs> come to Governor's Island. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi. Um, so, Shami, I just want to say that I am such a huge fan of yours, and I also live in New York and Sag Harbor, and I'm a member of Parish, so I'm really excited. Great, thank um, you. I first met you at the Independent Art Fair with your Georgia piece, uh -huh. and I have a photograph of us. Yeah. Uh, Susan. 
and we're Hi, Instagram Susan. friends. Tamashi, yeah. I love. I just follow you all the time, and I just love what you're doing, and I love it, the show at Tilton. And but I, it's. I was just going to say, I'm on the. I'm on the. Um, on the on the board of the Eastville Community Historical Society in Sag Harbor, which is in the black community. And um, the history there is amazing. And we have the cemetery and we have the Zionist church, which was part of the underground. And I'm hoping that you will come when you're out there and come and talk to us. And we'll- Well, I want you all to talk to me, you yeah. know? But I want you to, <laughs> I want you to come see our, our little historical society building and see the cemetery and meet some of the people that grew up in that community. And part of Sands, we're, we really just got historic preservation so that some of those buildings cannot be torn down. And the most interesting thing is Azure Rest is one of those three communities. And one of the most important houses in Azure Rest was, was designed and built by a woman who was a black architect from the University of Virginia. And she had a house on the grounds of the University of Virginia called Azure Rest. So this was Azure Rest. Nor uh, recreated the name in uh, in this community sands, these three communities you're talking about. So I want you to come see these houses and meet the people and see the, the, the old photographs and everything. Invitation we, complete. I'll great. be there. Fantastic. Okay. East, Eastville was, was on my list for oh, sure. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So I'm, yeah. Glad. I'm glad. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? You mentioned town hall meetings. How do you envision that to be structured? Oh, so, oh uh, around the parish? Mm hmm I have no idea. I mean, I have to go talk to people. I have to go. I have to go. I have to go listen. I have to go. Um, I have to go meet people, and then together we'll figure out what is ethically appropriate. And like I said, we have built a lot of contacts, especially through the education uh, department at the parish. There are lots of contacts through two community leaders, to schools, throughout the Hamptons, and we usually work through these people, through the you know representatives or leaders of these communities. And we ask them, you know, how would you like this to be done? How would you like us to interact with you? And can we be a platform for that? So that's what we will be doing with, with Tomashi. Hi, Tomashi. I love your work. Thanks. Um, what's I, your name? Nadia. Nadia. And, and what's her name right behind you? Maimona. Maimona? Nice to meet you. Nice Maimona is actually at the parish right now. Oh, I'll see you there. Yeah, we'll be working on this together then. Um, th hi, Nadia. Hi, so my question is, I graduated last year from my MFA, and I know that... You're just going to leave me hanging like that? <laughs> from Montclair State. Cool, congratulations. Oh, thank you. Hold thank on a second. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you, thank you. And you, the fact that you consider yourself a painter is something that I really relate to. It's someone that works in different materials, and... How have you, as a, I mean, how, how do you establish yourself as a painter, especially like when you go on to, when you're starting out and you're trying to apply to different things and it's really how, like how you, how I, or you know, like this is how I see myself. Meanwhile, the way that the work is constructed is mixed media. I don't know, I mean, painting, 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 painting. It's like what it's, I mean, drawing is the, drawing is the root of all things, but like all like imagined, like, you know, uh, things that that's communicated with the hand. That's the way I understand it. I'm really obsessed with my photographer friends. Um, I was just staring at one. I wasn't just being just randomly weird. <laughs> but uh, yeah, painting, I mean, I guess I'm still trying to figure that out, but it's like, I, I painted murals. I dropped, out of, I dropped out of art college when I was 19 to paint murals in uh, Northern California. So like I, the way that I have understood art that, what, that wasn't, access was not dictated by my classroom or by my teachers is from the street and that was through painting, always. Um, in Los Angeles and in Northern California, so that's uh, that's how I identify. That's that's what that is a a, a history and a and a lineage that I proudly feel feel beholden to, and sometimes I feel like I stray, <laughs> but I'm always try but I but I see I continue to see the work as paintings, and I want them to I want them to function as paintings, and I'm still. I'm still figuring that out. I mean, I'm surrounded by brilliant painters. The, this, this year's biennial is an amazing show. Painters that I love and respect in that show. So I feel like I'm always like relearning 
and rethinking. I mean, that's what we're supposed to be doing. It's none of this is figured out. Not for you, not for me, not at least not yet. You know, so like the the learn, we're still figuring out what our languages are in the making. And like one thing that gets me caught up is all of this this research because of all of that public painting. I've I also feel uh, compelled and responsible to engage narratives of public concern. In that way, I still are, I would argue that the work remains figurative because it implicates us all. That's the way I think about it. I think I've, I've, been, I've been working to get to this place because I've been trying to find a way to make work that was inherently public, not necessarily obviously public, um, to see what would happen, to see if a painting language could arise from that. that that's, my, that's my internal question. So for you, I would just, I would hold on to, to like um, the sacredness of what your internal questions are, what your material questions are for you, and not so much how they appear to other people. People see all kinds of stuff in the work, and I get a lot from other people seeing things that I don't see, but I, I don't necessarily, you know, collage is a component of a whole lot of stuff. There's, colla uh, photography is a main component of collage. I low-key would like to be a photographer. <laughs> uh, but, um, but, you know, painting is, painting is a very specific history that I feel, I feel deeply, I just feel deeply, uh, inside of uh, museum institutions and outside. So um, I'm still working, I'm, I'm working with that. Or as my friend Ariel Jackson would say, I'm, a, I'm gonna rock with that. <laughs> Congratulations. There's so many great painters for you to be looking at right now. Just, just be looking at paintings. Stay looking at paintings, and you'll continue to see yourself. Because I also like, you know, when I got here, I was really obsessed with Wally. I was obsessed with my, with my faculty members at, at, at Cooper. So I was obsessed with Waleed Rod, and Hans Hakka had just become Professor Emeritus, but I was learning about his practice, because I had always learned about all of these West Coast artists uh, being a, a girl and a teenager on the West Coast. So I was really interested in ways that, uh, that international and East Coast artists engaged public dilemma in work. So that's all, it's all in me. And, and it's, I don't feel like it's a fight anymore though. I used to feel like I had to figure out like what is public, what is private, ah, oh, the dichotomy. But they're not mutually exclusive. Like none of us are. All right, that's it. One more, last question. No? Hey. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, my name is Kevin Claiborne, and I. You're just, Kevin Claiborne. I am. Wow! Um, hi. Hello. <laughs> I'm a photographer, so I can show you uh, how to yeah, do that. Yeah, I know. You can show me how to do this. <laughs> I just had I just started an MFA program as well. Well, you finished, but I just started, and um, at, oh, Columbia. <gasps> and hi. I just had one quick question. Uh, what do you do when you're stuck? Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what do you mean stuck? So, like, I, I feel like my practice is, like, a lot of it is research-based. It's about, like, black identity and mental health and the environment that we find ourselves in and how those things intersect and overlap. So I do a lot of, like, reading, and there's a lot of, like, brain before the process. Mm -hmm. But, like, when you're mid-process, right, and you're like, I think it's going this direction. However, I'm not sure about maybe how I want to present this information, whether or not I want to do painting or collage or whatever, if you're stuck in terms of like the materiality of what you're actually physically working with or the end result or just like the research in itself, like what if you're like, I want to focus on this, but I just read something and now it's taking me left. Like, what do you do when you reach that wall? If you, if you do. Mm -hmm. Oh, I do. Yeah. I, geez, uh, I have to pray. I have to, I have to run around a lot. Um, with this with this work, I found myself with the work that's in the biennial. I found myself laying on the floor of my studio and having to like think through think through some processes. The big piece, uh, hometown buffet, kept me up at night because I needed. I think I was in a good place at that point because I I needed to see how this transition from one blue to, one, to the other was gonna happen in what seemed like a really chaotic space. That piece isn't chaotic for me, but, I, it, but it like kept showing up in my dreams. I've like, oh God, I've try, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to, con to continue to come back to like being open to whatever the work needs to be. And so like if I'm doing my part and if I'm doing my part like with, if, if, like with the research component of a project. I learned that at MIT, actually, that the work could turn out to be any, it could turn out to be all kinds of things. And 
and sometimes it's important to be ready for that. It's hard for me as a painter because I want I actually want things to be controlled as paintings. So I'm actually like in this grappling place with that right now. But and then I think about Albers and and other greats who came before us who um, truly believe that practice comes before theory. So um, and so like you have to be doing. I think I think you have to keep doing. Uh, I would encourage you to draw. And even if it's even if it's stuff that nobody else sees, that's probably better, you know. Because like when we're in these pressure cookers, there can be this compulsion to always be making for someone else's eyes or for someone else's critique or approval. And there are some parts of your process that there are methodologies that might be revealed to you with your doing things that you wouldn't do to show anyone else, yeah. you know. And I hope you're writing, but you're an image maker. You're an image maker. God, I have so much respect for the hardcore photographers that I know. I don't know, I don't know what y'all are supposed to do. Maybe some sienna types or something. I don't know. But like, I've, keep... I've actually been doing a sculpture. I just made a, a chess set and a Rubik's Cube that are both completely black, mm -hmm. which is something that is not... I didn't make it for anyone else, but I was toying with the idea of, like, I like to play chess. And mm -hmm. I was like, uh, does white have an advantage in chess mm -hmm. or not? And mm -hmm. at a higher level of play, it tends to win mm -hmm. more often. And I was just doing things that were like stepping away from the camera because mm -hmm. I was stuck mm -hmm. and not worrying about who I'm presenting the work to, but mm -hmm. just kind of like exploring. So. Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of the disciplines. We have all of these disciplines. I would sometimes have, I had students who really inspired, <laughs> really inspired my brain to come up with some other like solutions when I was first teaching at Mass Art. But there was, I had some students who were so brilliant and you know, when we're like 18 or 19, we don't know what the heck is going on. And sometimes we can't even see how brilliant we're being. I remember telling one student, respect the discipline until you can respect yourself. You know, so like, you know, like we can respect photography, painting, we can respect sculpture. I love that we have these like actual like houses, you know, like disciplinary houses that have all of this documented history around them for us to play around in and to absorb. And then, we, and then we can merge them or push the edges or, or whatever, but they exist and we can like push and pull against them um, and we can respect them until we figure out whatever is happening with our own hands. It doesn't sound like you're too stuck though. I look forward to seeing this work. You know, what comes from it? Cool. Word. Thank you.